Welcome back to the most painful challenge I've ever attempted. If you haven't seen the first video yet, I would recommend you do so before watching this. If you can't be asked to go and watch it for yourself, or if you need a quick refresher, basically I just got one million dollars without committing a single crime. It sounds simple, but trust me, it really wasn't. Before we start this thing, I'm going to go over the rules as well as some of the changes I've made to them. If you don't want to listen to me ramble for two minutes, go to this time here. So the rules are, I am not allowed to participate in any activities deemed illegal by California's law. As well as this, I am also going to refrain from killing anyone, even in situations where it could be considered self-defence. I guess you could call this a pacifist challenge also. In the first video, I limited myself to do the challenge completely solo and without any help. This time however, as decided by you guys, I'm going to allow myself to play with other people. I'll be able to freely join public sessions and join people in different game modes, such as races, adversary modes, etc. However, I am not allowed to have any friends help me out, so I can't for example just get one of my mates to do a illegal mission for me and then give me all the money from it. This by itself is illegal. The final rule is that I am not allowed to use any of the free stuff that Rockstar give you. No free cars, no free properties, no handouts. I somehow forgot to mention this rule in the last video, which inevitably confused quite a few people when I avoided buying the free cars and garages. Now that's over with, let's get on to what you actually want to see. For this video, the name of the game is Investing. And no, I'm not talking about JPEGs, I mean proper investing, like real estate, businesses, stuff like that. And what do you need to do before investing? Research. Not wanting to waste my time with useless ventures like my last video, I decided I was going into this knowing what I'm doing. Every risk I take is going to be calculated. No more mistakes like driving a motorbike without a helmet, driving on a highway with a vehicle under 49C. No more jumping off the pier, none of that. Nigel is now a businessman, and goddammit, he's gonna start acting like one. Before I started jumping into public sessions, I wanted to get myself sorted out and look in the part. So the first thing I did was go into a private session. But don't worry, I won't be in here for too long. I left my cosy little garage and got this man a free piece suit. With us looking as sharp as this, I'm sure we could cut a deal with just about anyone. The next thing we should probably do is purchase an actual car. A man in a suit riding a pink moped really isn't a good look. I decided to go for a cheap but respectable Oslot F620. Now that I look the part, I just needed something to invest my money into. After opening up the properties website, I quickly found out that I didn't have nearly enough money to buy anything good. But fortunately, there was one thing that I could just barely afford, and that was the biker clubhouse. Not only would this finally give Nigel a bed to sleep on, but it would also open up a lot of job opportunities. One of which was his new bike auto shop business. From what I've seen, it looks to be completely legal. To get access to this business, I needed to also buy an additional mod shop for my clubhouse, which cost a total of $740,000. This would almost wipe me out of all of my hard earned cash. I had to compose myself for a minute and really think if this was worth it. But with literally no other way to invest my money, this seems like the most sensible choice. I clicked purchase and made my first investment, and just like that almost all of my money that I gained from a previous video is gone. The speculation is done, now it's time for me to head over there and accumulate. I walked into the place for the first time, and I think it's fair to say that I really overdressed for this. I guess I overestimated what 1 million dollars can get you nowadays, but that isn't the point. The main thing I'm concerned about is climbing the financial ladder, so I thoroughly looked into every single way to make money from this place. There are four main things the clubhouse offers. Contracts, a bar, illegal businesses and a bike auto shop. Let's go over all of them. Pretty much all of the contracts involve doing something illegal, like stealing bikes, stealing drugs or assassinating people, which good old Nigel here would never do, so that writes them off. The bar was really promising at first, it could have easily been a legal way to make some passive income. However, as if Rockstar themselves were to spite me, you need to regularly resupply it, and to do so you have to steal a van filled with alcohol, which writes it off completely. And the illegal biker businesses, if you somehow couldn't tell already, are quite illegal. You have the option to purchase different kinds of properties which will produce different kinds of contraband, like meth, cocaine, weed, etc. Many of you did mention on the last video that weed is technically legal in California, so this weed business will be a completely legal thing to do, right? I don't know about that. In California, you need to have a license to legally sell marijuana, and even if we assume that Nigel here has one, weed vendors can only carry and sell so much at once. You can't have over 28.5 grams on your persons, and unfortunately the smallest amount of weed you can sell in GTA is one of these massive bricks, which looks well over the limit. If we also take into account that the police will sometimes apprehend you when you sell product, it's clear to see that this just isn't going to work out. That writes off every other business except for one, the biker auto shop. This business is pretty simple, customers drop their bikes off and tell us exactly how they want it customised. We oblige them, and our trusted mechanic, Zach Nelson, does all the work. They then give us full permission to deliver their bike back to them. No police, no shooting, just completely honest and lucrative work. Once a customer bike arrived, I wasted no time in getting it customised. 
It took me a painfully long 12 minutes to drop it off. Most of that time was annoyingly spent at traffic lights. But to my delight, dropping it off yielded a massive paycheck of $180,000. Although this is really good, this amount of money is only short term, as the first sale you do is always tripled. After this, I'll always be getting $50,000 per bike delivery, which is still really good. The only catch is it takes a very long time for a customer to drop their bike off. There seems to be a cooldown of around an hour per delivery, but what would I do in between that time? I think it's about time that we finally jump into a public session and find out. Just to be safe, I changed my name to something a little more inconspicuous and finally pressed find public session. Lord give me strength. The first session I got into only had six players in it, which is perfect for what I want to try next. Having players in my session now opens up quite a few job opportunities, so I left my clubhouse and reviewed my options. I first checked all of the MC work, and I think I could quite comfortably write them off. I've played through most of these missions before, and I just can't see any way I could justify them. I then checked out the VIP missions. Just like the MC missions, I really couldn't justify most of them, but there was one job in particular that stood out. Executive Search. The premise of this mission is to hide in a small area of the map and avoid getting killed by other players. If I managed to survive for 10 minutes, I would get a hefty paycheck of $45,000. As this was quite a small session, I knew it would be unlikely that anyone would come after me, so I started it up and headed to the area. After driving around the place for a few minutes, I decided to pull over and wait out the 10 minute timer. As I expected, no one bothered coming after me, so that was probably the easiest money Nigel has ever gotten in his short legal life. Let's hope we can keep this up. After completing executive search, I realised that I hadn't yet checked out the VIP challenges. I skimmed through most of them, mostly unimpressed by what I saw, but then I stumbled upon salvage. I completely forgot about this one. The premise of it is to dive underwater in designated areas of the ocean and collect 50 checkpoints within 10 minutes. This seems like a no-brainer. Sure, I'll probably have to avoid areas which are likely to be no-dive zones, like the docks or military graves for example, but overall it's a pretty simple job, right? Not particularly. In order to start this mission up, I need to invite someone to be my bodyguard, which means that I'll be responsible for another player. This was quite a scary prospect for Nigel, as he had never interacted with another player before. But for the sake of maximising profits, it had to be done. To have a better chance of people joining me, I found a new session with a lot more people in it. I made my way over to the nearest coast and began inviting people. As soon as someone joined, I wasted no time in starting the mission up. One thing I stupidly didn't think about was how I was going to get to the salvage zone in the first place. The game does provide you with jet skis, but I wasn't about to just steal them, so my only choice was to run and swim towards it. But by the time I got to the salvage area, my bodyguard had already cleaned up all the checkpoints. I barely managed to snag 6 of them, while he got 44. I was pretty shocked by how fast he managed to collect them all. I mean sure, I took my time getting here, but he was quite literally zooming through the water like it was nothing. If I didn't know any better, I would say that something fishy is going on here. As to be expected, he won the challenge and got all the money. He called me the best CEO, which I'll just take as a compliment I guess. He then invited me to get in his suspiciously fast car. I didn't like the idea of getting in anyone's car, let alone a modder's, so I promptly found a new session. We just started this challenge and you were already seeing modders. If this doesn't set the tone for the rest of the video, I don't know what will. To hopefully lower the chance of this happening again, I decided that it would be a good idea to purchase a sea shark. This will make water travel a lot easier, and it should hopefully pay for itself in no time. As the mission had a pretty sizable cooldown and there's still no customer bikes to be delivered, I had some time to kill, so I thought it would be a good idea to tackle the junk parachuting challenges. Now some people questioned in my last video if doing parachute jumps were actually legal, and to be honest, if he was doing it in free mode like this, I would say no. However, I would like to think that when Nigel does these parachute jumps, he's actually been sponsored to do them. This is how he gets the money and reputation out of it. The fact that we've got a helicopter dropping us off, checkpoints to go through, designated landing zones and zero police interference leads me to believe that these jumps were given the go-ahead by the local government. Kind of like how flying a plane under bridges in free mode will be terribly illegal, but doing it in the context of flight school justifies it. Anyway, sorry about that massive tangent. There are 10 junk parachuting challenges around a map that give you $5,000 each. Although it's not that much, you do get a bonus $100,000 for doing all of them. So I thought, why the hell not? Nigel's no stranger to parachuting after all. The first one I decided to go for was on top of Mount Chiliad. While I was driving there, it dawned on me that I couldn't actually drive my car up the mountain, as it was only meant for hiking, so I had to park up and climb it on foot. You gotta commend Nigel for doing all of this whilst wearing a suit. When I got there, I picked up the parachute bag and began the challenge. I mean at this point, Nigel was a pro at parachuting, so to the surprise of no one, he smashed it first try. Shortly after landing, I noticed a strange UFO hovering above the ocean. In case you're confused, this challenge took place a few days before Halloween, so we're definitely going to see some more stuff like this as time goes on. Taking a picture of this UFO got me $15,000, which I obviously won't be saying no to. The second parachute jump took place on Mount Chiliad, again. I really didn't feel like hiking up it again, so I tried my luck with a taxi. They're quite well known for not exactly following the rules of the road. 
so I thought he would give me a lift up the mountain, but after seeing where I wanted to go, the taxi driver said, nope, sorry dude, and kicked me out in the middle of nowhere. I bit the bullet and wasted another 15 minutes spamming the jump button. I did the parachute jump and claimed another $5,000. I only had 8 more jumps to do before I could claim that $100,000 reward. I don't want to bore you with 2 hours worth of driving and parachuting, so I'll just quickly summarise some of the interesting things that happened during that time, like me getting absolutely decimated by a flying car. The guy killed me a further 2 times, so I chickened out and found a new session. There was the occasional spammer in chat promoting modded accounts. This seems to be stupidly common on PC, so expect a little bit of censoring. The most interesting thing that happened was a random player getting in my car. So get this, I was just minding my own business, heading towards another parachute jump, when this dude comes out of nowhere and starts beeping at me. The guy gets out of his car and just decides to hop in mine. I had absolutely no idea how to deal with this. I wasn't sure if I should find a new session or kick him out or whatever. This could have played out horribly if he started shooting, as it would have likely given me a wanted level, which would quite obviously be detrimental to the challenge. Luckily, he didn't do anything like that. The worst he did was point a loaded pistol to my skull, but other than that, he wasn't too bad. I very quickly parked up and went to the parachute jump before he had a chance to change his mind and mow me down. After this, I cleaned up the last of the parachute jumps and finally claimed my $100,000. Now I could go back and do these jumps again every real life day, but to be honest, it was so mind-numbingly boring and took so long that it probably wasn't even worth the money in the first place. I was literally using taxis just so I didn't have to bother with driving. I went back to my original idea of just doing salvage. Just like before, I invited random people to be my bodyguard and started the mission up. Now that I was armed with a jet ski, this will be miles easier. There's no possible way I could fail this time. The bodyguard left, which failed the mission instantly. Now that there was yet another cooldown, I decided to check if a customer bike had been delivered. Fortunately, it had been, so I got it tricked out and sent his way. That's another $50,000. Although I wasn't having the best of luck recently, I've seemed to have gained a fair amount of money so far. I just needed things to start going my way for a while so I can make some real progress. With newfound confidence, I jumped right into another executive search. The travel there was less than ideal to say the least, but that's just a small roadblock. I was mere metres away from entering the area, when surprise, the mission failed. I took too long to enter the search zone, which is apparently something that can happen. This was a bit annoying to say the least, but I guess on the bright side I was now closer to the ocean, which means it's time for my third attempt at salvage. This time it went a lot better. I got to the zone extremely quick and snapped up 37 checkpoints. I won the challenge with ease. I was blown away by how much money you actually get from this. The combined money from every checkpoint plus winning the challenge would get you just below 80 grand. This was ridiculously good money. To keep the ball rolling, I jumped straight into another executive search. It was a hard fought battle, as it felt like half the session decided to come look for me. It was way too close at times, but I somehow managed to pull through. After this, I once again jumped back on salvage. I hopped my jet ski, invited people, and started the mission up. This time, I managed to get every single checkpoint, which got me the maximum reward of $80,000. This is essentially what I did for the next few hours. I swapped between salvage, executive search, and delivering customer bikes. Of course I failed a lot, got griefed, etc. But let me tell you, Nigel was making bank like never before. The only big setback that I had was I had to spend $320,000 on a gun locker for my clubhouse. I was getting annoyed with always having this axe, I mean, antique artifact, on me at all times. And sometimes a pistol that I threw away at the start of a challenge would somehow materialise into my inventory. It seems that the game doesn't like it when you haven't got any weapons on you, and will sometimes just give you a pistol out of nowhere, which as I mentioned last time is illegal for me to carry, so it would help a ton if I could just choose not to have anything at all. Fortunately, I quickly made back those losses, and with my fifth bike delivery, I finally broke past $1 million. Would you look at us now? We're back to where we started in terms of money. That clubhouse we bought has almost paid for itself. At this point, I was eager to make another bold investment, but the time wasn't right yet. I already knew that I couldn't afford anything good with the money I had, so for the meantime I just had to get my head down and grind some more cash. The next few hours were just a blur of missions, modders, griefers, advertisers, and racism. GTA 5 in a nutshell really. Although my confidence didn't waver, I was getting a little bit bored with doing the same missions over and over again. For a change of scenery, I tried my hand at Slasher, as it was double money due to it being the spooky season. As you can expect, not being able to fight really does hinder your ability to play a competitive game. But luckily, hiding seemed to be good enough most of the time. There's one huge aspect of the game that I somehow forgot about, and that was the loaded shotgun you'll be given after you survive for a certain amount of time. I tried dropping it to no avail, so I just decided to unequip it and not move until the round was over which somehow worked. I played a couple of rounds, but at some point, the slasher left, so the game gave me the role of slasher. I really didn't feel comfortable with this at all, so I immediately left. That was both scary and potentially detrimental to the challenge, so I decided that it was a terrible idea, so I never played again. I decided to just go back into my usual mission routine. Around about an hour in, I had a strange interaction with another player, and he seemed to be somewhat reasonable, so I took a risk and invited him into my car. 
Now, much like the last guy that got into my car, I had absolutely no idea how he was going to react to my good and proper legal driving. To my disbelief, he was actually very patient. He simply waited while I followed all the road laws. When we got to executive search, he behaved exactly like a bodyguard should. Just watch what happens when we get approached by another player. He completely understood what to do. He only started shooting when both of our lives were in danger. Although he does have the right of self-defense, which he obviously used to his full advantage here, he was openly carrying and using a firearm in public. It could be debatable whether this is legal or not, considering the circumstances of our lives being in danger. Plus the fact that, given the right permit, bodyguards and security guards are allowed to carry if the job at hand requires it. But either way, I could just plead that it's got absolutely nothing to do with me. I wasn't the one that pulled the trigger after all. Unfortunately, our fun was cut short as we were both overwhelmed and killed. Even after the mission was over, we kept getting killed by the same guys, so eventually I had to take my leave. But that was probably the most rememberable part of this challenge for me. After all of these negative interactions Nigel has had with other players, it's honestly a breath of fresh air to see someone noticing what I was doing and following along with me. Maybe I was judging people too quickly. About an hour after this interaction, I had another one. Me and this random guy were just chilling on jet skis, genuinely just having fun and messing around with each other. Of course, it was short-lived, as he was decimated by a submarine torpedo, but it still stuck with me. After this, I cracked on with my journey. Halloween was in full swing at this point, so the UFOs and spooky weather was here. I actually made a small fortune taking pictures of these UFOs. Overall, it must have got me around 200,000 plus. Not too shabby at all. With all of these opportunities to make money, it's no surprise that I finally broke past $2 million. At a milestone like this, I think it's high time that I show my stats, and explain some of the things on there that don't really make sense. I'm going to show the whole clip, so skip to this time if you don't care and just want to get back to the action. Okay, time for some excuses. Under the crimes tab it says I've shot out 88 tyres, which is ridiculous. I haven't even shot 88 bullets during my whole playthrough. The times I did shoot were all in the shooting range, so I have no clue how this happened. I'm guessing that when someone else blows up the vehicle I'm in, or shoots out my tyres, it counts as me shooting them out, but with testing I couldn't recreate it. This amount kept on increasing throughout the whole playthrough and I still have no idea what causes it. I'm going to assume that this is a bug and move on. There's a few stats on this page I need to clear up too. My furthest wheelie stat must have been done in the stunt race which I didn't show in the previous video. I haven't got any clips of it unfortunately, but I do remember testing out a bunch of stunt races with Nigel. I believe I even mentioned it at some point during the last video. The 264 car crashes it says I've done is a bit misleading. Any crashes that a taxi does whilst you're in the back seat also counts as your crash. Plus, sometimes the NPCs of Los Santos are incredibly impatient, and will ram into the back of you if you don't go immediately after the light goes green. Trust me, I've tried exchanging insurance details. It never works. Motorbike crashes was also likely due to the incompetent drivers of Los Santos. Although I didn't show it, I do remember getting flung off my moped a few times. The 60 bales from a moving vehicle stat is pretty easy to explain. This stat counts jumping out of a helicopter during parachuting as a bale, so it would make complete sense why I have 60 bales here. In all, aside from those exceptions, and that one unfortunate wanted level I got from the first video, all my stats are still fairly clean. Ok, time to move on. I now have 2 million dollars to play with. The big question now, with all of the different ways I could possibly invest it, what would be my best option? You know that little tangent I went on at the start of the video about researching to avoid dumb mistakes? This is where that comes in. With a million and one options, I somehow had to make the most sensible one. So I researched every single little thing I could possibly do in the game. When I say everything, I literally mean everything. Let's first tackle the businesses. The first one we'll look at is the auto shop. This was a favourite for many people down in the comments, and I do agree it would be a great legal way to make some money. It's essentially the bike auto shop business but better in every way. But there's just one teeny tiny catch that most people don't realise, how you actually start the business in the first place. If we look past the possible conspiracy to commit major armed robbery side of things, before we even start the business up we have to steal Cezanne's cousin's car from a police lockup. You really can't justify this no matter what you do. If we can't do this mission we can't access the business, so this whole business is impossible to do on our playthrough. Let's move on to the offices. 
Although nice and luxurious, they don't provide us with many crimeless options. With the office, we can buy both a vehicle cargo warehouse and a special cargo warehouse. The vehicle cargo business is all about stealing cars. We would quite literally be committing Grand Theft Auto, which is very much illegal. Pretty open and shut. The special cargo business is a bit different. It's all about the buying and selling of goods. It sounds legal, but when those goods are drugs, weapons, organs, animal parts and alcohol, it does seem somewhat less legal. There are some cargo types you could make arguments for, like jewellery, bullion, gemstones, etc. But let's be honest, these are likely to be stolen anyway. It's not like you can even pick and choose what you want to buy, as it's always random. The sale missions are also hard to justify, as you'll be driving vehicles which you likely aren't allowed to operate, and you do sometimes get police interference too. I guess in theory you could spin this enough to make it sound legal, but for me I'm just not buying it. Let's move on to hangars. They're home to potentially the worst business in the game, air freight cargo. Pretty much all of the missions involve flying an aircraft, aircraft that aren't yours and most of the time have deadly weapons attached. I'm not really comfortable with flying outside of flight school. The airspace in Los Angeles in real life is very protected. I highly doubt that Ron is always asking for permission every time we take off, and even if he was, it would be unlikely we'd even get it, especially in a busy airport like Lax. Also, to get your hands on cargo you have to steal it, so it's pretty clear that this just isn't going to work out. Next up is bunkers. This should be pretty easy to write off as the whole business involves the manufacturing and selling of illegal weaponry. All of this stuff is black market and very illegal, which is why you often get police interference when selling cargo. Let's just move on. Next up is the facility. This property gives us access to multiple intense story focused missions which is all about preventing the end of the world. A lot of people said on my last video that the doomsday heist is completely legal to do, as we are literally working with the government to prevent the end of civilization. so surely this would make us above the law. In all honesty, I think that would be true, but there's one thing that people forget about. When we start Act 1 of the doomsday heist, we're not actually working for the government at all. We're working for Avon, who was fired from the IAA. We're just hired guns taking orders from a paranoid rich billionaire, which still makes everything we do very illegal, even if it is for the so-called greater good. Next up is the arcades. This was by far the most promising business out of all of them. You get passive income for just owning an arcade, and the amount you get goes up depending on how many machines you have. This is completely legal, right? It is, but this is where the setups for the business ruin everything. In order to start the arcade up, you have to first get some arcade machines. Surprisingly, we aren't actually stealing them. They're all paid for and sitting on the back of a truck, waiting for us to pick them up. But of course, it's never that simple. The truck gets stolen by some random thugs, so we have to steal it back from them. From my research, I found out that it should be technically legal to steal something back that was stolen from you. However, the big issue with this is how you go about taking back your stolen property. For example, chasing the truck down and blasting the driver in the head with an Uzi probably isn't legal. But let's say you was to maybe wait for the truck to come to a stop at a red light, approach the truck in a calm and collected manner, politely persuade the thug to exit the vehicle, enter the vehicle yourself and drive away in a timely manner. In this situation, we could legally complete the mission. It sounds great on paper, but trust me, in practice, this plan falls apart. I won't bore you with the details, but let's just say it's very hard to escape a horde of angry thugs with guns whilst following all traffic laws. In testing, I unfortunately couldn't do this mission even once, but I think it could be possible if you get lucky enough. However, even if you do, it would all be in vain anyway, as the next mission you need to do requires you to scope out the casino. In this mission, you have to hack the casino cameras. No matter what way you slice it, hacking is illegal. We were so close, yet so far away. Let's move on to nightclubs. This business is also very promising. It gives you varying amounts of passive income depending on your nightclub's popularity. It's completely legal, but once again, the setups for it get in the way. To set it up, you need to hire some security and bartenders for your nightclub. The vehicle you use to pick these people up is Tony's. It's pretty likely that you aren't insured to drive this vehicle, but let's assume for now that you are. With careful driving, this mission can easily be done. The next thing we need to do is bring the music. Dexes, speakers, the whole lot. The only way we can do this is to steal it from a party bus in the middle of a desert. Now, the YouTuber TGG also did a crumbless playthrough a while back. It's a pretty funny video by the way, you should check it out. His main business of interest was a nightclub. When he got to this particular mission, the excuse he used to justify stealing it was that when you enter the party bus you seem to already have the keys for it, which means that the party bus belongs to you. Now, I can see where he's coming from, but personally, I'm just not buying it. The dialogue in this mission does somewhat imply that you need to steal it. In any case, the ownership of the keys to a vehicle does not mean that you own said vehicle. Another thing unnoted about this mission is that there is always, without fail, an NPC on top of the party bus. As soon as you get in the bus, they all go into a panic state and will not move. The only way to get them off is to drive, and as soon as you do, they get flung off and die, which obviously isn't legal in the slightest. I don't mean to out TGG like this, but in this video, he has two of these NPCs on top of his party bus. As soon as he gets in, the video jump cuts to him on a highway, missing both the people and the skull light. That's another issue with this mission too, the big skull light. It's impossible to get into the city, let alone your nightclub without breaking this thing off. 
I challenge you to start on the desert with a party bus and drive all the way to a nightclub whilst following all traffic laws without breaking this thing off. No matter what path you take, you're bound to run into one of these traffic lights, which the party bus is just too large to fit under. Once again, this is a bust. I also checked all 132 contact missions, plus the yacht, casino, ULP, short trip, MOC, terabyte and special vehicle work missions. I can assure you that not a single one of them were legal. So where does that leave us? Two million dollars in our hand. A million things to spend it on but none worth the money. The eagle eyed of you out there would have realised I omitted a singular business. I did it purposely to add suspense. So what business was it? The agency. This thing hasn't got any strings attached. No setups. No wild goose chases. You buy the business and you get the business. This property offers access to the Dr Dre contract. Although we can't actually do it because the first mission needs you to do this. Yeah, how that shit feel, bitch? But that doesn't matter. The security contracts are where it's at. These contracts will have you doing some mostly illegal jobs for dodgy rich people. However, by my use of mostly, you can probably tell where this is going. There's a certain contract called asset protection. In this mission you have to protect a client's assets from bad guys. If you manage to protect at least 1 out of 10 of their assets, you'll be rewarded some decent money. There's only one small issue with this mission however. It is incredibly difficult to fight off bad guys when you yourself cannot fight. So how do we get around this? In this mission there are two types of enemies, gunmen and molotov dudes. The Molotov dudes will only focus on destroying the crates. They will completely ignore the player and all friendlies. The gunmen, however, are a bit more of a pain. They will always charge and attack the player, which will inevitably result in a lot of deaths. After some testing, I've come up with a strategy that seems to work most of the time. All you have to do is run far enough away from the area to have all the gunmen chase you. In turn, having less of your friendlies get caught up in the gunfire, but remaining close enough so that your friendlies can still defend the assets from the Molotov guys. If we go too far away, the friendlies won't render in, which allows the Molotov dudes free reign to destroy the crates. It's a vicious balancing act, one that does result in a lot of deaths. But as I said, it does seem to be the most successful strategy. Another interesting thing to note about these security contracts is that every time you complete one of them, you'll get an extra $100 added to your overall daily income. For example, if I complete 5 of these contracts, I would get an extra $500 every day in my safe. If I do 100 contracts, I would get 10000 every day. This maxes out at 200 contracts, which equals $20,000 every day. Having this slowly build up over time will progressively increase Nigel's earnings. So it's a win-win, really. I looked up how much the cheapest agency costs, and as it turns out, I have just barely enough money for it. This will once again wipe me out with all of my hard-earned cash. But if my research has told me anything, is that this is the next logical step. So once again, I made another massive investment. As soon as I bought it, I wasted no time heading over there and greeting my new business partner. Man, everybody I asked about setting this thing up, they all pointed straight at you. You know what? Looking out of this window really brings to light just how far Nigel has come. From being on the cold, hard streets, to looking down to those same streets in a luxury high-rise office. So what now? What more can I really do with Nigel? Am I just going to keep on making cash with no real goal in sight? Well, it may have seemed like that throughout this video, but I do actually have an endpoint in mind. An endpoint that I had my eye on ever since Nigel took his first step since Los Santos all that time ago. I've always planned to take this challenge as far as it can go, to do everything I can within the strict rules I've set myself. To complete GTA Crimeless, if you will. I plan to purchase the most expensive thing in the game. A fully customised yacht. This thing will cost me a staggering $10 million. Why on God's green earth am I buying this useless thing, you may ask? This isn't even an investment at this point. Oh, but you'd be mistaken. There's a certain mission I can do with the yacht that is completely 100% legal. Having access to this mission will actually allow me to acquire money ever so slightly faster. The mission is called Privacy Prevention. In this mission, I have to defend my yacht from enemy players for 10 minutes. If I managed to do that, I would get $50,000. From my extensive research, I've concluded that this alone is the last thing I can possibly buy that will give me any sort of monetary benefit. This will be my final big investment. Am I ever going to break even with this thing? Good god no. But after buying it, I'll be able to officially say that I've gone as far as I possibly could have gone completely crime free. But of course my turmoil was far, far from over. I now had to acquire 10 million dollars. This is quite literally going to take weeks. But that's okay, it's not like I upload much anyway. Cue the very epic gaming montage.
So there you go, Nigel's on top of the world. A super yacht, a high-end agency, a bike auto shop. He's done it all. As our friend Nigel's story comes to a warm and fuzzy conclusion, I think we should all take a page out of his book. No matter how much life crushes you, no matter how hard the going gets, stay true to your morals, cherish them, and run of them. I was going to leave this video off here, but I thought it wouldn't be right if I didn't show off my stats for the final time. Now, I have a confession to make. I made a really big mistake whilst grinding for that sweet $10 million. While I was preparing for another salvage mission, I stupidly picked Most Wanted by accident, which gives you an instant 5 star wanted level. I panicked and left the game within seconds. Now in my defence, this was at the end of a 11 hour play session, but that doesn't take away from the fact that my stats are now permanently scarred with this. Let me tell you, this really annoyed me, but I really couldn't do anything about it. Although no laws were technically broken, it still hurt. I deeply apologise for this. Please feel free to critique any of my other stats. Okay, with that over with, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you later.